Hi, Carl again, Realty Executives. Thanks for stopping by again. Well, one of the things that we've been talking about so far is objection handling, and really the 11 most common objections that a seller is going to give you when they're going ahead and talking about listing their home with you. It's important to understand, I think, that there is a difference. The difference between an objection and a condition. You see, salesmen often make this mistake where they forget that sometimes a seller just can't do something. For example, you know, they may not be able to list their home for sale because, you know, um, I don't know, a relative is deathly ill and is staying with them. And they're, they're more concerned about taking care of that relative. They may not be able to sell because they are having hip surgery and they need to stay in the home for a few months while they recuperate. Uh, they may not be able to sell because they are in uh, upside down for ha perhaps. If you don't do short sales, they could do a short sale, but if for some reason they decide to go ahead and not perform a short sale, well then they can't pay a commission. So the thing is, salespeople a lot of times will forget the distinction between the two. Remember, a condition is nothing more, okay, it's nothing else, but something that prevents a seller from selling, okay? They can't do it. While an objection is nothing more than a question that remains in the subject's mind, okay? That remains unanswered. So when you're talking to your clients, remember that, you know, you need to understand the difference between those two. If they're physically able to sell that home and they're starting to throw up questions to you, be happy because at least they're considering hiring you. If they weren't considering hiring you at all, then they would never ever throw up an objection. They'd probably smile and say, well, hey, thanks for stopping by. We'll think about it. We'll get back to you later, okay? So remember the difference between those two, all right? Now, yesterday we left off with number five, or I'm sorry, number seven. So today we're gonna hit number eight and they're gonna get a little bit more complicated as we go along, all right? So number eight is, look, another agent said that they could get us more money, all right? So the seller's talking to you, you know what, Carl, we really appreciate you coming out, but you know, perfectly honest with you, you know, another agent said that they could get us more money. So let's take a minute and figure this out. Why is it that they bring this up? Well, it's because of a natural tendency for people to try and believe the best of all possible worlds, okay? The thing is that if I tell you in honesty that your home is going to sell for no more than $100,000, while an agent from a competing company comes along and says, gee whiz, you know, in their head, they're thinking, you know, I need to go ahead and get this listing because I'm not prospecting, I'm not doing lead follow-up, I'm not doing the qualifying that I'm supposed to do, and I need this listing, so I'm going to tell them something a little bit higher so I can get the listing. You know and I know this happens all day long, all right? So they'll tell them 110. So put yourself in the seller's shoes. On one hand, they have one agent, you, telling them 100,000. And then on the other hand, they have an example of an agent, okay, who is a relatively the same expertise, at least in their head, all right, as you are, who's saying 110. And how are they to know the difference? So obviously, they're going to be concerned about that, and that's something that you need to address. So again, the best way to handle it is just with truth and logic, all right? It doesn't need to be this drama dramatic, drawn-out thing. Just make it real clear, uh, real clear, real plain, real honest, all right? You know, Mr. Seller, I can appreciate that. Remember, cushion it, all right? And what you probably don't understand is this. And now, stop for just a second and think about the truth of this. An agent that will list your property overpriced assumes that they can go ahead and take the listing now and then start beating you up on the price week after week after week after week. I mean, is that really what you want? Who would? See, they're afraid to tell you the truth up front. Now, Mr. Seller, do you want the truth? Well, of course you do. Well, then let's do the right thing and simply sign the contract so I can help you get what you want in the time you want it. Wouldn't that be great? Great. Sign the contract. Now, the thing about this is 
you're, you're illuminating to them the fact that other agents will actually go ahead and tell them something. Now, they know this. They're not stupid. Unless it's the first time they've ever sold a home, most people know that agents will typically go ahead and tell you what you want to hear and then go ahead and start pounding you on a price reduction. If they've not experienced it for themselves, then they've heard of it before and maybe their friends have experienced it. And that's the last thing they want. And so when you start telling them, hey, look, obviously an agent that will list your home overpriced, you're making a statement of what's really going to happen. All right. Just assumes they start, you know, they can take the listing now. Remember, ass out of you and me. Okay. And then start beating you up on the price week after week after week after week. You know, you make a big deal out of this. So they understand the seriousness of this, how they will lose money in the long run and how in the end it will not be a very enjoyable experience. So hopefully that's covered that one. Number nine, you know what, Mr. You know, Carl, you haven't sold any homes in our area. Now, in this particular circumstance, all they're simply questioning is your ability to sell the property. All right. So if you're in a marketplace where you're competing against somebody who is the neighborhood specialist, okay, all right, you'll come into this. Or perhaps if you're in a smaller company or something along those lines, you may run into this. If you're a new agent, you'll run into this. And so it's really important for you to go ahead as a professional real estate agent, get this objection down cold. All right. Have it like a, just like a, like a, like a, like a laser beam. You're focused on it. You're ready to go. All right. So when they say to you, well, Carl, you know what? We really appreciate you stopping by, but you haven't sold any homes in our area. Remember again, you want to cushion it, you know, validate what they're saying and say, you know what? That's a valid concern, you know, and what you, the reason, the obvious reason why you'll list with me, okay, is because that my company has homes for sale all over the community, meaning that when you list your home with me, okay, we can expose your property to buyers from all over the community, okay? Do you really, you know, recognize how powerful that kind of marketing is, okay? You see, isn't that really what you want? Of course it is. All right. So then all we need to do now is simply sign that contract so I can get you into San Diego by May, which is what you said you wanted. All right. Let's go ahead and sign the contract. Thanks. Now, the whole concept here. All right. People have this myopic view that if you're a neighborhood specialist, then you will know exactly what to do to sell that home okay don't misunderstand your job is to market this property to the widest group of people possible for example here in tucson a great example is sam hughes all right sam hughes neighborhood is a great neighborhood a lot of folks like it it's close to the university of arizona it has some good schools a lot of people who live there are doctors lawyers architects you know the higher profession type people and the thing about Sam Hughes is that there have always been agents who try to go ahead and niche market into this marketplace. Now, one guy will be it for a year or two, then somebody else will be there for a year or two, then somebody else will be there for a year or two, and they'll be the neighborhood specialist. And then when you go into Sam Hughes, okay, they are accustomed to seeing this person's signs everywhere. They're accustomed to getting mailers because they've been farmed, all right? So when you're trying to break into this particular listing, the way that you want to distinguish yourself between them and somebody else, okay, between you and this other neighborhood specialist, the way you want to distinguish yourself is this, that you have to illuminate to them the fact that if you list with Joe Blow, who works in only this neighborhood, then your home's going to be exposed to only these people. Mr. Seller, you need to understand that the buyers for your home are going to come from everywhere. And that's why you need to go ahead and special have a, a person like me who specializes in getting the word out on a home like yours, okay, to all these people from all over the neighborhood. That's why when you have signs on the marketplace, the more listings you have, the more signs you have, the more signs you have, the more the calls you have, the more calls you have, the greater buyer traffic, the more buyer traffic, the more obviously the homes will sell. 
So that's why you tell them, you know, obviously you realize, okay, that, you know, the reason why you're going to choose me is because we have, you know, homes for sale from all over the neighborhood. And are you familiar with just how, how powerful that kind of marketing is? You really want to emphasize that kind of marketing. And the reason why is when you're talking to them, you want to make the distinction between the types of marketing. Marketing like to the people in the neighborhood, because I'm running a farm and I've got signs in the yards and so on and so forth, postcards, or that kind of marketing, which is marketing to people who are from all over the community, who are the people who can actually do business and do business now. So make sure when you're using this objection handler that you go ahead and say that. Now, number 10, Carl, we really like what you're having to say so far, but we're curious, what do you do to sell homes? Now, let's think about this from the seller's perspective. So far, they really like what you're having to say. They're almost there, okay? And now they want to know specifically what it is you're going to do to make this happen. Now, two approaches. You could approach it from the perspective of your marketing plan and say, well, number one, I do this. Number two, I do that. Number three, we do this. Number four, we do that. The problem is you will seldom do things that are any different from anybody else. Okay. We all have access to the same tools. We all have the multiple listing service. We all have the internet, realtor.com. We have flyers. We have signs. Maybe you're using CAD, uh, call capture, open houses. But, but really, what the heck is it that you do that is so different than anybody else? I would challenge you one day to sit down and think, make a list of all the things that you do specifically to sell a home. What is it your plan to earn that $18,000 to sell their home? What is it that you do? And I would be hard pressed for you to find, you know, reasons that are $18,000 worth of reasons. I mean, let's just be honest. You are not paid for the things that you do. And let me say that again. It's going to piss you off, but I'm going to say it again. You are not paid for the things you do. Okay? The reason why I can make that statement so clearly, so uh, um, convincingly, is because if that were true, if you were able to go ahead and do the things you do, the multiple listing service and signs and open houses and flyers and call capture, you know, maybe doing some, uh, you know, some door knocking, uh, I don't know, uh, advertising in the paper, things like that. This is stuff that if, if I had a home that's $200,000, and I was going to pay a 6% commission, that's $12,000. If I had $12,000 of cash in my pocket, I could do everything as a homeowner that you can do at a hell of a lot less price. Okay, I can put my home on the multiple listing service with an agent for $500. I can print up a gazillion flyers. <laughs> All right. I can go ahead and hold open houses because I'm on the weekends. I'm not doing anything. I'm going out and I can network with some agents. Of course, I can go to, you know, the realtors and go ahead and lay out flyers at their different offices. What you get paid obscene amounts of money for, okay, is three things. The first thing you get paid obscene, obscene amount of money for is your knowledge. The more you know, the more you're worth, okay? Let me rephrase this. A mechanic who works on your car gets paid a lot of money because he's gone to school, because he's taken the time, because he's gone through the process of learning all the intricacies of that business. You, likewise, have taken the time. You have gone ahead and accepted the challenge of working for yourself as an entrepreneur without being paid a salary, without being paid on a regular basis, working off commissions, staying up those late nights trying to figure out how the hell you're going to pay your bills. Then, of course, taking the time to go out and become members of the Realtors Associations and the multiple listing associations that you belong to. And then in the very end, you know, all of that risk that you've taken 
That's the reason why you get a reward. That's reason number one. The reason number two, the reason, second reason why you get paid obscene amount of money is because of the negotiation skills that you possess. This third party negotiations, there is a value in that. When you can sit down and work out a problem with a seller, think about this with a for sale by owner. A for sale by owner, when they get an offer that comes to them, and I was just sitting with a for sale by owner just yesterday who said, you know what, all we want is cash. He was overpriced, <laughs> imagine that. And I asked him, I said, well, what is your plan for when the value doesn't come in? You want $369,900, and the market is indicating that you're only going to get about 350. What is your plan for when that appraisal comes in at 350,000? Could you please tell me that? He says, "Well, look, I just want cash. That's all I want." But now, let's just ask yourselves between you and I. Okay, nobody else is here. What is the likelihood of that for sale by owner being able to negotiate that deal? I'll tell you right now. Zero. He has no chance whatsoever with that mindset of making that happen. Most sellers want to go ahead and try and sell their homes by themselves as is. You and I both know there has to be some give and take. In addition to that, you can also manipulate the sales price. Maybe raise it up a little bit to cover closing costs. Okay, They don't think about that. They say, well, no, the buyer needs to go ahead and pay for their own closing costs. And they're willing to kill a deal over it. Look, you and I both know it doesn't have to happen that way. We go ahead and we negotiate the sales prices up a little bit to cover closing costs. Usually 3% is not a problem, okay? Those sorts of things are common knowledge in the realtor community. But in the public's eye, when they sell one home every five to seven years, it's not common knowledge. And with the training that you're obviously getting from your company or from realty executives, from me or from other trainers that you're getting, you are understanding very, very clearly what it is that you need to do to sell real estate in high volume. And so what I want you to take away from this, the reason number two why you get paid obscene amounts of money, okay, is because of your negotiation skills, this third party negotiation. And then finally, the reason why you're able to go ahead and charge obscene amount of money for the work that you do is your ability to think outside the box. Not only do you have those tools, but you can find ways to go ahead and market that property to an individual niche, the people that you know, okay? So for example, if you've got a $45,000 house that is a wreck, it needs to be cleaned up, it needs to be started over, it needs to work, okay? You know investors, you know wholesalers, you know the people who can take this deal and make it happen. If the property has mold or something like that, then you know people who aren't afraid of that. If the home is in great shape, if it's fantastic shape, ready to be listed, ready to buy, people move in, turnkey, then you know other agents and people in the marketplace who are looking to buy now, okay? So that's the third reason. And the thing that they're trying to understand from you at this moment of truth is what the hell should I pay you $12,000 for? And when you come out and you say, well, I can do this and I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, big deal. So can they. So there is no compelling reason why they should go ahead and pay you that kind of money. So what you need to do is illustrate for them the difference between agents. Agent A selling his homes at 5% commission Agent B selling their commissions at say or selling their homes at say six or seven percent, and there's no distinguishable difference between the two. They're going to go with the lesser price guy all the time. You know it, and I know it. So how do we combat this through education and truth? So you say, well, look, that's a valid concern. That's understandable. I understand. I agree. That's valid. Words like that to cushion and validate what it is they're saying. And let me ask you this. Are you aware that there are two different types of real estate agents? Oh yes, absolutely. You see, there are passive agents and then there are active agents. I am an active agent, meaning that when you list your home with me tonight, okay, I spend my time actively marketing, okay, your home and to the other agents in town. Now, isn't that really what you want? Well, yes, it is. Of course it is. You see, you want somebody who's going to work aggressively 
and actively to sell your home. Isn't that right? Well, yes, it is. Okay, great. Well, then all we need to do now is simply sign the contract so I can help you get what you want, get you off to Colorado, get you in there before the snow falls, and have a great time with your family. Sign the contract. And they're like, yay! So the thing is, you're illustrating the difference. No person wants to pay $12,000 to a passive, meek, unconfident agent, all right? They hear about nights, nightmare stories on the market all the time. The expired listing list is higher than ever, all right? People who have not sold their homes have experienced this firsthand. And if they have not experienced it firsthand, then they've experienced it through the activities vicariously of others. So what you need to understand is you need to illustrate to them that there are two differences. There's somebody who's active, who's out there working every day, comes in eight o'clock, leaves at 5.30, 6 o'clock, working your plan, whatever your plan is to sell their home, versus somebody who uses the 3P method of selling homes, which is place it in MLS, put a sign in the yard, and then pray it gets sold. If you wanna add a fourth P to it, hey, get paid. That's the difference in real estate, and that's what you need to illustrate. Number 11, we want you to cut your commission. Ah, now here's the granddaddy of them all. When you're talking $12,000, that is a lot of money. And you have to ask yourself, why is it that they're starting to ask me about my commission? Well, really there's two reasons. The first reason is because they're not confident in the reason why they should pay you an exorbitant amount of money. You've not made the case as to why it is that you're bringing value to this equation. You're not bringing to them the understanding that look, if you sell your home with me, you will make more money, okay? Bottom line, you have to have that understanding, you have to have that confidence in yourself that if I sell your home, you will make more money. End of conversation, that's all there is to it. When you get that in your head, you're gonna go really far to making sure you never get this commission objection. But let's pretend for some reason they go with option number two. The second reason why they might say it is because they want to see if they can cut the commission. They just want to ask, hey, everybody wants a bargain. And that's pretty common. Great sales techniques has been used on me that Mike taught me that it worked really well. Okay, I went to go buy a new car. Love that car. 2010 Mustang, black, it's beautiful, got all the bells and whistles. I bought it in 2009, so it was a brand new model. Now I go out there, I talk to the salesman, he's a great young guy, brand new, obviously. I've been selling real estate for 16 years, I know the business, you know, I've been selling for a real long time. This guy comes along, okay, he clearly doesn't have that same kind of experience. I say, well, maybe we can shave a little bit off the price because the price is a little much. You know, maybe we can work with that. And he says, no, we can't. It's brand new. That's what we charge. That's just, you know, really what it is. Because of the, the thing that he possessed, all right, the car, I wanted the car so bad that I was willing to pay a little bit more. Was it possible that I could have shaved off the price if I'd walked off the lot and come back a little bit later? Probably, okay. But the fear of loss, for me, losing the car, was greater than the opportunity to gain, which was a smaller price. The fear of loss is always a greater motivator than the opportunity to gain, and you'll be well to not forget that. So when they're asking you, will you cut the commission? A simple answer. Okay, understand it's nothing emotional, it's personal. I mean, it's not personal, it's business. No, any other questions? As simple as that. Do you, will you cut your commission? No, any other questions? Now you're gonna say to me, well, Carl, wait a minute. They can't be as simple as that. And yes, it is. It is just as simple as that. And nine times out of 10, that's all they're looking for is an excuse to ask. Once they've asked, you said no, it's over. But on the occasion that they will say, well, wait a minute, okay, Joe Blow said he would. How come you won't? Now, this is the last objection 11, of course, we're on. And 11, part B, if you will, is when they say, well, Joe Blow will. 
again, cushion it, validate it, okay? I appreciate that. And can I tell you why that makes me nervous? Well, okay, nervous, why? Why does that make you nervous? You see, an agent that won't stand up to you regarding their own value, how strong could they possibly be defending you and the price we set on your home? I have that courage. Do you feel that I can sell your home? Well, yes, we do. Great. Then all we need to do now is simply sign the contract so I can get you off to Florida so you can do the scuba diving you want to do before the weather gets too crazy. Sign that contract. That's as simple as that. Game over. You win. Okay? You have to illustrate the fact that you have the courage to defend the price and to defend them when the time comes. And if you can't show them that you can defend your own value, how strong could you possibly be defending them when the time comes? So I hope that these 11 objections have helped you out quite a bit. I appreciate the comments down below from some of the from some of the subscribers. It's been great. I've got a lot of emails about this. I hope this has been a value. If you did like this and you really felt some value from this, then please go ahead at the bottom there and just go ahead and like, subscribe, and comment. Because what you do when you like, subscribe, and comment, you hand this out to other people who could benefit from this as well. So thanks a lot. We'll look forward to talking to you soon. Have a great day.